Hi, we're Josh and Arielle Wamsley, owners of Green Valley Tree LLC, based in North Windham. We're proud to sponsor Connecticut East this week and to serve the communities of Windham and New London counties with our tree removal and plant health care services. Visit our website at greenvalleytreeworks.com for a full list of our services or give us a call on 860-234-4041. We look forward to hearing from you. She was the first Latina to become president of a university in New England. We talked to Dr. Elsa Nunez of Eastern Connecticut State University on her 18 years as she announces her retirement. Plus, we take a look at other stories making the headlines from around the region. This is Connecticut East This Week. Hello, I'm Brian Scott-Smith. Connecticut is fortunate to have many great schools, colleges and universities, and among them is Eastern Connecticut State University, led for the last 18 years by Dr. Elsa Nunez. Back in May of this year, she announced her intention to retire, and I sat down with her shortly after that announcement to find out more about her decision and a look back over her career. President, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's so nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Not at all. So, 18 wonderful years. You've decided it's time to move on. We'll be talking about that a little bit later in the interview. But what's this 18 years meant to you? Oh, my gosh. You know, you tell young people sometimes when you they talk about their careers and what they want to do. You know, they're young. They're here majoring in different subject matters, and they have dreams and wishes. And you say, you just want to see if you can find something you love, have your passion, and so that you can be happy in your job. And I feel, honestly, that these 18 years I've hit a home run. It was a good match for me. I can't be president of UConn. I can't be president of some small private colleges. But this was a really good match for me. I love the faculty here. I respect them enormously. And I was a faculty member for a long time at a state university that also was public liberal arts. And so I always felt a connection to the mission, to the faculty and staff, and of course to the students. And so it was easier for me to do the job and to provide leadership when you you can be yourself. I felt for 18 years I was genuinely myself in a leadership role. You are, without doubt, probably one of the most authentic and honest, I would say, presidents of a large academic institution, which speaks volumes, of course, to your leadership, absolutely. There's clearly been challenges along the way. First Latina president of a university, a woman as well, you know, in a world which sadly still is too dominated by men, it is changing. Talk to us a little bit about some of those challenges, because I'm sure there's been a few over the years. Yes. First, I I want to thank you for those generous words about uh, the way that I've tried to lead. I have always felt that at a university, it's like a hospital. You can't tell doctors what to do. You can't tell faculty what to do. You have to persuade them that your idea is a good idea and convince them by persuasion, by giving them facts, you know, data, that what you're proposing is reasonable and is uh, something they should support. And I always said, if they catch you in a lie then they won't trust you. And so building trust over time was really part of my goal. And so that transparency that you noted was part of my presidency because I really felt it was important to always tell the truth. And I live by that with my administration, with my team. I always tell them we have to tell the truth. And sometimes that's hard because people aren't ready for it. So I was appointed president of Eastern Connecticut State University, and I am the first Latina president of the university and the first one in New England, which is pretty amazing that it took a long, long time to get here. You know, I say that, and to the people listening, I say it's not always easy to have that label. You know, I am proud of it. I am proud that I'm the president of Eastern and I am of Hispanic origin. I'm Latina. But I also don't want that to be my only label because I'm 
I'm an American. My parents were very devout U.S. citizens, and they loved this country. I was raised in an environment where we loved America, and my father in particular was very grateful to be here. So being of Latina descent just is about my heritage, and it's important, and I'm proud of it. I speak Spanish. My children speak Spanish, not as well as I would like, but they do speak it. We still eat. Puerto Rican food, Hispanic food, and my grandchildren love it. And I've taught them how to cook pork and rice and beans and other things because I think it is really important, as the listeners know, to preserve one's heritage. But I have scars from it. I have scars, and, you know, there's not enough time in this interview to talk about racism, to talk about oppression, to talk about being marginalized. And I felt that as a little girl, and I felt that growing up. But somehow, the love that my mother and father gave me gave me the strength of character to, you know, push that away and go on with life and try to always look at the glass half full and and be joyous about the day that I accomplished something. So when I became president, my mom and dad were alive. My dad died at 90, my mother at 93, and they were very proud that I had accomplished this because that's why they made the sacrifice to come to this country. They knew no English. They were poor as, you know, they had nothing, and they made the sacrifice for their children. And so I wear that with great pride that I was the first Latina president in New England. Born and raised in Puerto Rico and of course as you've said come over here with your with your parents. A life of academia and University of Maine system at Lesley University. What got you into that whole sort of like education thing because that's that's a challenging role as well. I mean academia isn't easy. No it's not it's not. Well you know my dad I mentioned uh, in the last uh, exchange we had that my mom and dad were from modest backgrounds. But my father always said to me, the only way we can get out of this hellhole that you can get out, he used to call it a hellhole in Spanish, is through education. So very early on, I was exposed to the idea that if I wanted a better life, I needed a great education. And so I worked very hard in high school and then got into a university. And in those days, the counselors were not like they are today where they lead you to the application process or through the application process. I didn't have any of that. I was pretty much on my own. And I managed to uh, find my way through a public university in New Jersey called Montclair State University. And then I went to Rutgers for my doctorate, which is also the Research University of New Jersey. And I always felt on the way that it was a way to a better life. It wasn't just education for education's sake, but that it somehow I could look back and help my family, you know, whatever I accomplished. And I did for all the years that I spent in school and, you know, was able to get a good job and, and progressed. My family benefited from that. My parents had no pension. I was able to help them. And when they retired, they had a very nice retirement because I was able to help them. So I think that this idea of, in our culture, of getting a good education and then being aware that you have to give back not only to your immediate family but also to the community at large was an idea that was planted very early on. And I have lived my life as president here for 18 years trying to do that, helping people from modest backgrounds get a first-class education. I was going to say that is one of the big hallmarks, really, of this university, I would say, is that it is open to everyone. Yeah. Everyone is accepted here. Everyone is it's an inclusive environment. That is very special, clearly, to you. Yes, and I think that, that the, for the listeners, your taxpayers and your taxes have allowed Eastern to flourish. Where it's existed for over 125 years. And so it's public. And so it's it's not an institution for the rich. It's an institution for everyone. And so there's a nice mix of students here. For example, you'll have the son or daughter of a doctor, the son or daughter of a lawyer, the son or daughter of a teacher, of a fireman, of a factory worker, of a maintenance worker. And so the class differences here should make every listener proud because that's what you want. You want a strong middle class in a democracy, and you can't have a strong middle class if you're not educating the masses. But you don't want to give a mediocre education to the people from poor backgrounds and a great education to the people who could get into Harvard and Yale and, you know, the elite institutions, Williams, Bates, and Colby. You want it somehow to be equal 
in terms of its its excellence. And that's what we've tried to build here at Eastern. I think we've, we're successful, which is you get an excellent education regardless of your background. And I often say your mother can clean toilets, but you're going to get the best education possible. There's no stigma because your family doesn't have a fancy last name or because your parents didn't work in high-level jobs. Everybody has a shake here at getting a first-class education. Let's take you back 18 years when you knew that Easton was for you. You became the president. It was in bad shape back then because, you know, let's not underscore this. You had a lot of work on your hands, sort of almost like zero reserves. I know we just said that, you know, higher education today is sort of suffering a little bit. Take yourself back to those 18 years when you first stepped through those doors and those challenges that, you know, basically were in front of you. I made the mistake of not asking for the audited budget. (laughs) <laughs> they gave me the budget, but it wasn't the final audited budget. If I had seen that, I would have learned that they had negative reserves here, and that's not good. That's like you not having any money in the bank in case your furnace breaks or, you know, there's a tornado and your roof is ripped off your house, or if you're living check to check, you can't do that. You need reserves in order to be able to save for a rainy day, particularly because there are so many things that can go wrong in a large university like this. It's 6,000 students. I have 1,200 employees. So, you know, you feel responsible for them to make sure that you're running the operation in the best possible financial way. So I've had two CFOs in my presidency, two different individuals. Currently, it's Jim Howarth who works with me, Vice President for Finance. And he He and I have a very honest, respectful relationship. And I think to the listeners, I would say it's really important that I listen to him as the CFO and he listens to me as the president because I have a vision of where I want to go. We have a strategic plan that needs funding. So he can't dismiss those ideas. On the other hand, I can't dismiss his ideas of when and how we should be funding the ideas in the strategic plan. Sometimes we very aggressive. We can fund things. Sometimes we have to pull back a little bit because the year's been not as great as we would like. So building reserves was always part of my goal as the president. Today, we have $33 million in reserves. And that means that the people here feel secure. It gives them a sense of security that Eastern has been run well. And that means that we did without, though. You don't build those reserves and hire everybody possibly that you can do everything, buy everything that you want. You can't do that. It's like a home budget. You can't go shopping every weekend. You can't spend every dollar you have. You have to be frugal. And I think we've run this place in a very, very responsible manner. Well, you only have to look around to to see. And again, uh, you know better than anybody the new buildings that are here. Just talk us through some of that because there's new construction. There was stuff that had to obviously be modernized, you know, like any academic institution. As things progress, new technologies come out. You know, you have to be there. You can't be behind the curve. You have to be there because otherwise, you know, you're not providing that class of education education that sort of like facility that is going to help those young people as they step into their futures. Talk to us a little bit about some of those things because there's you know yeah, there's a lot that you had to do. That's such a good question. Because first of all you have to remember that we're public, which means that I, in my mind's eye, don't want to see buckets in the hallway collecting you know, water because there's a leak in the roof. I don't want to see graffiti on the walls. I don't want to see buildings with paint falling off. I don't want to see cracks in the foundation. Because if we're public and if we are bringing in everybody, why do poor people have to be in a dump? Why do they have to see everything around? And I always feel that the the way that we present the university, the grounds people here are fantastic. The grounds look beautiful. When they did a study, we had the lowest amount of deferred maintenance of all 17 universities. We are on top of it. We put money aside every year to fix one of the dormitories. We rotate them. We pull out all the kitchens and put in new kitchens. We don't wait for things to be falling apart. And that's really important because I think that's why you don't have graffiti at Eastern. And when you walk around, people pick up garbage at Eastern. If you see something on the ground, there's a tendency for a person to bend. I do it and pick up something on the ground. I think there's a respect for the infrastructure. And I'm very proud of that because no matter where you come from, you're getting a great education in aesthetically pleasing place. The other thing I would say about that is that this is an anecdote, but I think the listeners relate to it. I used to get a lot of pressure to put Wi-Fi into the dormitories. This is years ago before it was 
you know, it was just coming out. And everybody would say, you got to wire the, you know, we need Wi-Fi. We need, and the numbers for doing that were huge. It was millions and millions of dollars. Western, the president there, was doing it. So they would always compare me to Western and say, you know, he's doing it and he's wonderful and Western's one and you're not going with the times and you're behind the times. And then I, I used to read on technology. And the one thing that I read, an excellent article that says, if you wait, the price will go down. Because technology is like that. When it first comes out, it's very expensive. It's like TV, you know, anything. And then the prices go down. And I did. I saved the university so many millions of dollars by not jumping on the bandwagon at the beginning. I didn't wait a long time, but I waited just enough for it to become more affordable. And then, of course, we have Wi-Fi in all the dorms. So I think you can have the best technology. You can have beautiful buildings. But you have to be mindful where you're going to put your money and at what point you're going to invest. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, fiscal responsibility is the hallmark, yes. again, of a good leader as well. And, and a leadership team, as you were saying, you know, it isn't just you as part of a leadership team. And certainly when you're spending public money, you can so very easily be criticised about things oh, yes. that, that oh, you're yes. spending it on or not spending it on. Apart from obviously, you know, the buildings, etc. I mean, also the reputation of Eastern. I mean, Eastern has probably one of the best reputations, again, through the work of yourself and the, and the leadership team over time. You're ranked number one, sort of like in News World Reports, no small feat. You've also signed the uh, Second Nature Climate Leadership Commitment as well. Lots of things. Why, again, were these things important? I know it sounds a bit of an obvious question, but why were these things important? Yeah. Well, U.S. News and World Report, the parents read it, and they break the country into quadrants. Listeners probably know that. And one of the quadrants is called the North, not the Northeast, but the North. And it goes from Maryland all the way to Canada across Pennsylvania. So if you think about it, that's a lot of states. And also, that's a lot of universities and colleges. Well, we rank number 16 in the North. So that's pretty amazing in that catchment area that's so saturated with colleges and universities that we rank so high. And, in, in, of course, in New England, we were number one. We've been number one for a long time. And to me, that has said something about our brand because what U.S. News and World Report, some presidents hate it. When you're not ranked high, you hate it. When you're ranked high, you love it. They take certain variables, class size, faculty-student ratio, the amount of money that is given to the university through donations, the ability of students to do research, the amount we invest in our faculty. Those variables are markers of a great university. So even though you don't like the rankings, the variables are not unreasonable variables to measure uh, oneself by. And so I always was proud that on those markers, we were doing so well. When I first came here, we had an Institute for Sustainable Energy. Now we just call it the Institute for Sustainability because, you know, climate is more than energy. And that institute has three components. One is internally the curriculum and the major in sustainability. It used to be uh, environmental studies in the old days, and now it's climate and sustainability. And the courses that we offer, the second is our green campus. Are we living what we're preaching? Do we have recyclable? Do we have composting? Making sure that things are not wasted. And then the third component is the community the outside community. I want to say just a word quickly about each of those. The first is the students. In the old days, it was just about the major. Today, the listeners would be so proud that this generation, we sometimes criticize them, but they're wonderful, and they really believe that they're going to turn the climate issue around. They are passionate about two things, equity and climate. And so we have now put climate and its related subject areas in throughout the whole curriculum. It's not just if you're a major in the sciences. You could be a sociology major and talk about equity and climate. What does it mean to be poor and not have access to air conditioning or not have access to prevent flooding or to prevent those disasters to affect your life? That's really important. And political science, policy, they study climate policy at the national, state, and local levels, and on and on. So on that front, we are stronger today than we've ever been. Internally, I want to give an example to the listeners as well. For the first time this year, we told students not to throw everything away when they left to go home. 
We told them we would collect it. So we collected so many things, furniture, clothes, food. It was good food, boxes of things that they were going to throw away, sodas. And we donated all the food to the soup kitchen that was non-perishable, and they were so happy to get it. We donated clothes and furniture to the no-free shelter. And it was over 2,000 objects that we donated. Microwaves, small refrigerators, you know, clothes, good clothes that they have. They just didn't want to take it home. I mean, it's wasteful from their perspective, but it still was something we could do. And then finally, the outside community. We work with the schools to teach the curriculum, make sure that they teach in the curriculum issues of climate burrows. So climate at Eastern is not just about It's a bandwagon you get on right now. We've had my 18 years have been full of working on climate related issues and we're very proud of that. And of course, getting back to the local community, when you made the announcement a little while ago that you were going to be stepping down, obviously, as president of Easton, our governor sent out a a message. I'm sure you received a personal message from him, but a public message basically, you know, saying that your leadership has strengthened the university's connections with the local community. And and that is clear from, you know, from what you've just said. I know at the top of this, you said you didn't want to sort of like be labelled or or certain things. You have to be careful about how you are labelled. But what is the legacy that you want to be remembered by? That's such a, a powerful question. And I thought about that early in my presidency. I know that on my tombstone, they'll put beloved daughter, beloved wife, beloved mother, but they're not going to be putting beloved president on there. So I always knew that what was important to me were the values that I held and that I modeled for my children. And that that I wanted them the day I died and they put me in the grave to say, I'm so proud of my mother because she did these things. Not that she ranked high in U.S. News and World Report, but that she always acted in a way that she gave back all that she got. And so at Eastern, the biggest tension I had as a president was trying to marry excellence with access. Because you can be excellent and close the door to everybody who can't meet that excellence. And that's easy to do. I could have done that. What I struggled to do for 18 years was to be excellent and have mechanisms for people who couldn't meet that excellence because of whatever happened to them in high school, whether it was that they, you know, they just came from families that were broken or parents that neglected them for reasons that you have to be tuned into they had no control over. How do you give them a chance to come to a great university? And so my legacy, I think, will be that I was able to open a door for people with support systems to reach the level of excellence that I wanted for my children. There's so many people who graduated from Eastern who would not have had a shot at being at a great public university. And I feel that that's my legacy. Well, Dr. Elsa Nunes, president of Eastern Connecticut State University, we are sad, obviously, to see you leave, but also grateful for your 18 years of tenure here. Thank you for being on the podcast. Oh, I'm so proud that I was invited. Thank you. It's hurricane season, and your trees can be damaged by high winds. Green Valley Tree has you covered with our emergency tree service outside of our regular business hours. We offer emergency tree service by bucket, crane, and climbing for residential, commercial, and even municipalities across eastern Connecticut. From full tree removals, uprooted or broken trees, to broken, hung up, or fractured tree limbs. Call our emergency hotline on 860-966-5710 or visit our website at greenvalleytreeworks.com. Time now for a look at other stories making the headlines this week. State and federal leaders and environmental advocates are joining forces to battle an invasive aquatic species that is threatening the Connecticut River Basin. A plant known as hydrilla has been rapidly spreading in the river and, according to recent surveys, is now found widely up and down the entire river system. State Representative Christine Palm is vice chair of the state's Environment Committee and says it might be a nice-looking water plant, but the threat from it on the environment is real. When you describe hydrilla, it sounds almost like some superhero. It can thrive in poor conditions. It causes algae bloom. Um, It grows several inches a day. It it sounds almost like a cartoon monster. Um, It even hosts a bacteria that actually can punch holes in the brains of eagles. It sounds like something made up from a science fiction. 
U.S. Senator Richard Blumenthal has secured $6 million from the federal government to help pay for research and resources to begin looking at ways to control or eradicate the plant. Greg Bugby is a scientist from the newly established Office of Aquatic Invasive Species at the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station and said the type of hydrilla they are dealing with here in the state is like nothing else. We were able to determine through DNA sequencing that this strain in Connecticut is different than anything else found in the world and has different characteristics and appears to be much more robust and potentially more destructive. There's about a thousand acres in the river system right now, in the marinas, in coves, in tributaries, basically engulfing entire coves and tributaries, so it's basically impassable. The multi-agency effort to deal with the hydrilla problem will be using a special non-toxic red dye in the river over the next few months to study water flow, which will then give them the necessary data to decide if a herbicide can be used to kill the hydrilla. Senator Blumenthal also announced a $400,000 federal grant for a food non-profit in the town of Willimantic recently. Commercially licensed cooperative Kitchen, or Click needs the money for infrastructure upgrades to help its expansion plans in the town. Blumenthal Mithel said the money is just the start of what this means for the future for the cooperative. What's so exciting about this kind of enterprise is it will create jobs, it will drive the economy, and it will enhance and create opportunity because people have to begin somewhere and they can't all buy a huge freezer or a big kitchen to do their restaurant or to sell their produce or meat. Lee Duffy is the executive director of Click and explained what the funding means to them. You have to have good bones. We can't do any part of our plan unless our building is standing. And so this $400,000 is all about upgrading our building so we have a roof. We want to go solar because it's a good step to take out here. We do a lot of energy use out here with our food businesses. We need a new parking lot and we need a USDA loading dock. All of this to support creating new markets for our farmers and creating good healthy food for our consumers. Click currently assists 31 local micro businesses and six farmers in the region and has also applied for a $2.7 million grant to help expand its operations in the region. Volunteer firefighters at Columbia Fire Department have received a special grant of $136,000, allowing them to purchase essential up to date breathing apparatus kits. Scott Haddad is the Columbia Fire Chief and explained what they got for their money. With that grant, we purchased 25 brand new. Scott Air Packs, 25 additional spare bottles, and 30 SCBA masks for the firefighters to wear. The uh, AFG grant helps tremendously for small towns like us to help offset the capital budget. And now we have brand new air packs for our firefighters for the next 20 years. The equipment replaces older breathing apparatus that was 25 years old. And the new equipment means that every member of the fire department will have their own breathing pack and an iconic coffee shop in downtown New London closed recently after a fire ripped through its basement. Muddy Waters on Bank Street has been a go-to destination for city residents, businesses and travellers using the nearby train station for almost 20 years. David Precker is the current owner of Muddy Waters and said they're in shock over what happened, but they're looking at ways to restart the business. We're really trying to work with the local people, with the, with the building and zoning and you know the health district, fire department, everybody involved to come up with a solution to see perhaps if this is suitable to have a temporary structure or location for the time being. Mike Passero is the mayor of New London and a former firefighter and said he had the unenviable task of calling the owner to tell them their business was ablaze. The emergency alert system tells me if there's a fire in the city. I got the call somewhere around 5.30 and the first thing I did was I called David. He was already up on the road. I was up. I just asked him if he was at the restaurant yet. He wasn't. So unfortunately I had to tell him, well, I just got a call from the fire department. They're responding there. Both had that suspense while we're driving to find out how bad it really was. New London's fire marshal said they had determined the cause of the fire to be a chest freezer in the basement of the cafe. The coffee shop has been heavily damaged by smoke and is likely to be closed for several months for repairs and decontamination.
That's all from us for this edition. Do send us your questions and story ideas to the show via our website at Connecticut-East.com or Facebook or Twitter at Connecticut East and on Instagram at Connecticut East This Week. And you can listen to the show again on our social platforms on demand and by asking your smart speaker to play Connecticut East This Week podcast. And please like, follow and share on your social media too. I'm Brian Scott Smith. Thank you for listening. (laughs) 